Hello, everyone. This is Dr. David Rice, and if this is your first time here at Ignite University within uh, Ignite DDS's website, welcome. This is a recording of a program that uh, Dr. John Tuminelli and myself gave in Syracuse, New York on February the 7th of 2014. And this portion is going to be all about Emacs abutment solutions. So John's going to have a program that you'll find in Ignite U as well that's going to talk a little bit about the 4.2 software, bridge abutment blocks, uh, and some tips and tricks. But we're going to focus on the Emacs implant abutment and solutions, kind of highlight things, and we're going to cruise through. A little housekeeping first. This is a slide here of another page on Ignite DDS's website. So if you have any questions at all or concerns or just something to talk about, please feel free to head to the forum section. If you look at that top toolbar, you'll notice forums is uh, just about in the center of the screen. If you click on forums, you'll come to an area where you can see new post. You can give it a title to let us know what it is you're going to ask a question about. You can add content in that body content section. Whether it's a question, a concern, you can add images. If you have a case you'd like to talk about, you can actually add video if you want to upload video. And uh, do us a favor, it'll help us sort through things and it'll also help others who are coming here with similar questions or concerns. Where you see at the bottom of the screen, it says anesthesia right now. You can go to the right where the arrow is, click on that arrow, and that will allow you to tag this. Um, so anything related to this, if you could tag it CAD CAM or CIRIC, it'll pop up. And then simply hit post when you're finished with everything. It'll show up in the form section and we'll know where to look. So just a little housekeeping there. All right, let's talk abutment solutions. We're going to go through some of this really quickly because it'll be a recap if you were at the course. And if you were not at the course, please, please feel free to ask a lot of questions. But we've got a couple um, options to take when we're talking about Emacs, which is the very first true chair-side solution for us to build our own custom abutment solutions, which is awesome. So we have the ability to build an Emacs hybrid abutment, which will allow us to take um, what we would traditionally call a custom abutment and then fabricate a separate Emacs crown. We also have the ability to fabricate an Emacs hybrid abutment crown which we traditionally would look at as a screw-retained prosthesis, all in one piece. So we can either go cement-retained, which Ivo Klar and Sarek are calling a hybrid abutment, or we can go screw-retained, which Ivo Klar and Sarek are coming together to call a hybrid abutment crown. Just a little preview of uh, some of the concepts that we're going to talk about. Image on the top left of the screen is a clinical shot of a scan post, which is the titanium piece, and a scan body, which is the gray plastic piece that's on top of it, so more towards the incisal edge. That's how we're going to actually digitally capture the image, which you see on the lower left-hand side. Same patient, just the digital image versus a clinical photograph. That's how we take the information from our patient's mouth and deliver it to CEREC. On the right-hand side is an image of uh, what that tooth looks like as we design it. But think of this in terms of what we've always done in the past when we made a physical impression. We typically would take a healing cap off. We would screw in an impression post and make a physical impression. The only difference here is we're using what's being termed as a scan post and a scan body, and that helps our CEREC machine. Whether you're using the Omnicam which these images are based on, or a blue cam, to virtually capture the images. Same case, uh, this is actually sent to us from an awesome dentist out in California, August de Oliveira. He has done an awful lot of work in the CAD world with dental implants. Runs a company called Implants Made Easy. You can find them on Facebook. You can find them if you Google him. He's a tremendous educator and a tremendous clinician, but wanted to toss this in here as a, a quick little demonstration. 
of the prior images and what they look like at completion. So this happened to be a screw retained prosthesis. You can see from the top right image there's an access hole that once August uh, screwed this in place, covered that up, sealed it up with a little composite, and he's got a very beautifully made custom hybrid abutment Emax crown, all in one piece, screw retained. This is a case, uh, sometimes it's important to talk about the elephant in the room. So many people ask us, is Emax strong enough to be uh, an, an abutment solution for us? This particular case we did with Ivoclar about seven years ago. As you can see, top left-hand portion, crown on a model. This was before we had the ability to do this fully chair side. So this was a hybrid case where it was imaged and then sent to some of the awesome ceramists at Ivoclar. But what you see is an Emax crown, the top right-hand portion. Uh, we're staining the actual abutment portion to uh, shade it to look just like the crown. Beautiful result. And the lower portion is an occlusal view on the model and then a clinical shot of that Emax abutment in place. Really nice case, but point of the matter is um, we have Emax in the mouth as an abutment solution for quite some time. Same case, top left-hand portion, we had just removed the healing cap. Lower left is uh, kind of an uh, angled occlusal slash buckle view to show you a little bit about emergence profile and shading, contour. And then the larger image on the right-hand side is an occlusal view. So a highly aesthetic restoration and a very strong restoration. Quick shout out to my team. If you were at the meeting in Syracuse, you saw this image. If you've never seen it before, it's, I find it's always good to take a good chuckle at yourself. But uh, I scampered off to the ADA meeting in New Orleans this past year. And every year my team dresses up for Halloween, keeps it fun in the office. And they decided to take a picture and Photoshop yours truly in there. And I'd like to tell you I have abs of steel, but um, thankfully they picked this photo and not something different. Really interesting, those of you who've come to know me well over the last 10 years know that my motivation for purchasing CEREC was because in my heart I knew that it provided us an incredible opportunity to build the very best restorations we could in dentistry. I did not purchase CEREC and walk this road for any other reason than I thought it helped me to deliver optimum patient care from a restorative standpoint. That being said, with Emax as a chair side solution for the very first time, I can tell you that this becomes uh, an incredible opportunity for us to not only deliver that high quality care, but to save some money. So on average, to build an Emax abutment and Emax crown that we take from start to finish in our hands, costs about $165. Now I'm not sure, each of you I'm sure has worked with the lab to build custom abutments and crowns before so you'll know your fee schedule better than I but in general on a nationwide scale the lab fee to produce something of equivalent quality to what we're able to do now ranges usually between $350 and about $600 so at $165 we're in real good shape and uh, we have total quality control which I like a lot Kind of taking that initial thought um, where I showed you that case that's been in the mouth for seven years now. What we're used to is on the left-hand side of the screen. So we're accustomed to titanium custom abutments as well as zirconia custom abutments. And the question has been um, of late, the image on the right being an Emax custom abutment, is, is that material strong enough to do the job? Here's what I'm here to tell you. Um, that's just a quick little image of how the systems fit together. That's an Emax piece on the right-hand side and a titanium fixture. And those pieces will get looted together to become our custom abutment. But here's what Ivoclar and many others did. First of all, they made sure that we had the ability to produce a product that fit intimately with the titanium fixture that Serona makes. So what you see on the left is called a tie base. That is a stock titanium fixture that comes from Serona Dental. On the right hand side is an Emax piece that you and I will mill from our machines. Now we can mill it purely 
as a crown and an abutment, which is what you're seeing on the right. That's the underside of it. Or we can mill a separate custom abutment, and then we can make a crown that gets looted to that as well. The point of this slide, though, is if you look at that right-hand image, what you'll notice, um, kind of pointing towards the top of the screen, is a notch. It's the female notch inside the crown. On the left-hand side, on the tie base, if you look to the left of it, you'll see the male notch that that fits into. The way these two pieces come together, the fit of it is absolutely incredible. The precision of it is amazing. And that fit leads to uh, incredible strength in addition to the titanium and the Emacs itself. And here's what they found. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. So they cycled um, a lot of Emacs abutment solutions together. Uh, several thousand times, two million load cycles, in fact. And time after time after time, there was one of two things that failed. Now, most of the time, what failed is the same exact thing that fails when we've made implant restorations before. That's the screw. They could not break the Emacs. They could not break the titanium tie base that Serona made. It was the screw that failed if something was going to fail at all. The second thing that broke, and this was very, very rare, was the actual implant fixture. So the long and the short of it is, no matter how hard we tried, we couldn't get this Emacs custom abutment or custom abutment crown to break. It was always the screw, which has traditionally been the failure rate in the past. So is Emacs strong enough to do this job? Answer is very simply, it sure is. We kind of gave this course a uh, week after the Super Bowl, and poor Peyton didn't have a, a great day. But the point of this slide is, in order for us to win, we need a team that's doing uh, its job, and we need our team to come together where everybody is firing on all cylinders together. So a couple quick but very important points that you and I need to know as the dentists who are quarterbacking this whole situation. We need a few things. We need some great owners. That's you and I. We need to do our homework and learn. So kudos to you for coming here today and uh, re-watching this if you saw us live and or watching it new because this is how we get better at what we do. We need some great coaches. We've got some partners that, that come and bring this product to us. So Iva Clower is one of them. Patterson is one and Serona is the third. We have to have some talented players. We have some implant companies that we get to work with that help us make this happen. We've got to learn about how the process works, the software. We've got to learn how to loot these components together. We've got to learn how to fix them in our patient's mouth. And last but not least, I apologize for the typo, but uh, when in doubt, we've got to work with the lab to help us out when you and I are learning. Sometimes that's okay. So off the field, what do we know? Ivo Clower, Patterson, and Serona are the three companies that come together, and they each play a role in this. And what you need to understand is who does what. Because just as this process is new to you and I, this process is new to all these three players outside of the component that they deal with. So if you look to the left of the screen, what do we know? We know Serona produces the tie base. That's the titanium piece that eventually is going to wind up in our patient's mouth with that Emax component looted to it. Serona also is in charge of making the scanning post uh, as well as the scanning abutment. So our ability to take information from a patient's mouth and deliver it to CEREC depends on Serona producing a couple products for us. Next column is Emacs. We all know that Iva Clar has been making Emacs for years, and Iva Clar is still in charge of fabricating these great blocks that we're going to use. We come back under the CEREC software, and we're back under the umbrella of Serona. That's their piece. And then all the way to the right, we've got kind of the assembly of the Serona portion, the tie base, and Iva Clar's portion, the Emacs. And bundling this all up and delivering all of these directly to us is Patterson Dental. So the key is going to be to understand that if we've got questions or concerns about a product that comes from Serona, we need to be able to look to Serona. If we have questions or concerns about products that come from Ivoclar, we need to be able to look to Ivoclar. 
And at the end of the day, um, we're going to go to Patterson Dental to ask most of our questions. But as I said, this is going to be new to them, especially the reps. We're out training them presently. But um, process equally new to Patterson Dental as it is to all of us because they don't fabricate any of these products. They're the delivery mechanism for it. So we've got some implant companies we work with. We've got Nobel. We've got Strawman. We've got 3i. We've got other players out there, Astrotech, Zimmer, Densply. Uh, those are the implant companies we get to work with, some of which work with Emacs right now, some of which work with um, Incorus, which is Serona's zirconia abutment solution, and some of these companies work with both products. So in a nutshell, we're going to look at a few of them here so you get a sense of um, what we need to make sense of. If you start, for example, on all the way on the left-hand side, just as an example, we've got three companies, Nobel, Strauman, and Biomet. Within Nobel, we've got six different implants that we can build Emacs abutments with. We can build them off the Nobel Replace. Um, we've got the, the normal, plat we've got uh, two different platforms, NP and RP, as well as the wide platform. We can work with the Replace 6.0. We can work with Nobel Active in two forms as well. Next column you look at is implant diameter. So you've got all the sizes that we can work with based on the implant system within Nobel. The following column is the tie base. So when your patient comes to you, for example, if you look at that top column and they've got a Nobel replace NP, it's a diameter of 3.5, we need to know that we're going to order the NBRS 3.5 tie base it's got a reference number, if you look in the adjacent column, of 6282474. The interface size is a large. And that we can build Emacs restorations both out of an A14 block and an A16 block. And if you scan through this, take your time with it. I won't go through it in detail. You'll have this as a resource. But just as an example um, with these three companies, how you and I are going to need to look at things to know which parts which components we're going to need to order. A little close up here, this is an order form from Serona. Patterson is also coming out with an order form to help make this a little bit easier. But the long and the short of it is, um, you're going to start on the left hand side. This cuts off because of the size of the screen of course, but if you look just at the top you'll see Astrotech. Underneath it you'll see Biomet 3i. Under those categories, you're going to look and see which implant system specifically, just like we saw on that slide before. So I'll scan back for a second. We've got different implant diameters, tie bases, etc. This order form translates this for us, and right now this is a common one that you're going to see out there. Uh, again, based on the implant manufacturer, based on the implant system within that, you and I are going to order the appropriate scan post that has a reference number. We're going to let uh, our Patterson rep know how many we'd like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a form that you're going to see a lot and will likely be put in your hands of your Patterson rep. And if it's not, if your Patterson rep doesn't understand this yet, um, you can download these forms right off Serona's website. So piece of cake to get this order form, and you're simply going to go from left to right based on the implant system and the size and order the appropriate scan post and tie base and it all comes in a kit. It's pretty pretty easy to do. So once we figured out uh, all the important components um, pre-game, you know, before our patients come in, all the parts we're going to need and who does what, we're going to have some things that we need to pay attention to when our patient's actually there. We're going to have some choices to make. Do we want to fabricate um, a prosthesis that's going to be cement retained, so we're going to fabricate a hybrid abutment and a separate crown that will be cemented, or do we want to fabricate a one-piece hybrid abutment crown that will be screwed in our patient's mouth? Once we've figured out those choices, what's the actual process of it all? We're going to have to deal with some milling, some adjusting, some polishing. We're going to have to know how to assemble these pieces together and then what we've always done in the past is how to insert them in a patient's mouth. I'll give you a quick little tour here. Um, 
unless you're placing implants, this is how your patient's going to come to you, right? They're going to show up with a healing cap in place, and then we're going to have a job to do. We're going to need to figure out how we want to restore our patient. So this is, by definition, a hybrid abutment, or as you and I would have called all the years past, uh, an abutment, a custom abutment where we're going to do a cement retained crown. So we're going to fabricate this piece and we're going to fabricate an Emax crown um, on top of it. But the hybrid abutment, as you see, has the tie base, that's the Serona piece that we mentioned before, that's a stock piece, and then it is an Emax covering that we can design and mill with our Seric machines, and then those two pieces come together to be looted together to form one hybrid abutment. Now we've got total control over the shape of this abutment, how it emerges from the tissue, um, where we put the finish line, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have um, the ability to adjust this in any way, shape, or form that we'd like to, to get uh, the most aesthetic and the most functionally sound result. That's just an example of what you and I will see on CEREC as we design it. Cool part in the software is we can design both of these pieces together. So once we've uh, imported all the information, once we've scanned in the working arch, the opposing arch, the buckle bite, etc., we get to that design phase. We're going to build this crown out, and then what we're going to do is just split it, which is under the tools section. And that will allow us to see both the crown, which is right now kind of ghosted out in this image, and the hybrid abutment underneath it. And then, as I said, we have the ability to take that abutment that you're seeing on the screen right now. We can raise it occlusally. Uh, we can lower it occlusally. We can increase the dimensions buccolingually, mesial distally. We can move that finish line anywhere we'd like to uh, to support our, our superstructure, which will be a separate Emax crown that eventually will get cemented on top of this in our patient's mouth. The other alternative is the actual hybrid abutment crown. So this, as I mentioned earlier, is a one-piece abutment slash crown that will get looted to the tie base, same tie base from Serona, same stock piece, but the Emax portion that we design and mill is now one unit as opposed to a separate abutment and separate crown. This is one piece. So what's nice about it is it's a real efficient way to get this job done and there are going to be some instances where we really need to do this. So space would be a, a prime example of a time that we have to choose this option over the previous option which would be the hybrid abutment slash crown two separate units. But if think about it. If you're running out of vertical space that tie base has a certain dimension to it that, as I mentioned, is a stock piece. We don't have control over that. We don't have control over where the opposing tooth is. So if we have 5.5 millimeters or less vertically, this hybrid abutment crown as one piece becomes a really amazing option. Now, a lot of people are going to look at this and think, why am I not doing this all the time? If it's an Emax abutment and an Emax crown, why would I choose to make a two-piece system as opposed to making this one-piece system? And you're right. There are a few places where we need to build out the abutment and the crown separately. Just give you one quick example. Um, we'll go through a few more later. But imagine that this is an anterior tooth. Say it's tooth number nine like we looked at on that first uh, couple slides. Imagine that that implant got placed a little too far facially or maybe a little too far incisally and that screw access hole was right on the incisal edge. Or worse, if it was going to be towards the facial. It might not be the best place for us to have at screw access from a functional standpoint on the incisal edge as well as from an aesthetic standpoint. Even worse if it's facially, right? It's right out there and in broad daylight for everybody to see. So that's a particular instance where there's a significant advantage to making a hybrid abutment and then being able to cement retain a crown over the top of it because it's really easy for us to hide that screw access. But otherwise this is a really great solution um, and will become pretty popular as time goes on. 
because between the Emacs, uh, whether you use Empress Direct as a composite to seal this chamber or uh, you use Tetric Evo Ceram or an, another company's composite, um, today's ceramics and today's composites can be made to look really, really beautiful. Just kind of a visual of that example, you can see the image on the left. That's one unit as the abutment in the crown, and that's <clears throat> going to be looted in itself to that tie base like we've talked about as one piece. All right, so let's talk a little bit about rules with the game. <clears throat> when we are utilizing Emacs and as well as Zirconia with our Ceric machines, as of today, and you and I both know that this will evolve, so whether it's three months from now, six months from now, or a year from now, we'll have more options for ourselves. But as of today, we need to stick with single tooth restorations. We, uh, no one's going to stand behind us if we start having multiple implants and we start milling out um, splinted Emax crowns for them. So right now, one tooth at a time. Second thing, steer clear of small diameter implants. Why is that? Think about the slide I showed earlier where we have a tie base. That's one component. And we've got Emax. That's a second component. So on a small diameter implant, you got to think of why am I using that? Probably because my space, mesial distally, is small. So if I have a thickness of a tie base and I have a thickness of an Emax, I might run out of room, mesial distally, in order to build a restoration that has adequate strength, right? Emax has minimum thicknesses that we need to live by in order to make this restoration strong. And a narrow diameter implant really restricts our ability to get an adequate thickness of Emax in order to make the restoration successful. Uh, also want to be careful with large angles. So um, if a, a case comes to you and the correction that you're going to need to make is greater than 20 degrees, this is not a great solution to use. Stick with what you've been doing all these years. Make a physical impression. Um, and have uh, a custom abutment made out of titanium like you've always done in the past. Um, thirdly on the slide, just in general, remember the guidelines for any implant placement. So this is more of a housekeeping item where Serona and Ivoclar and Patterson are coming together and saying, hey guys and gals, don't go putting in a 4 millimeter length implant when you know you need one that's 11 millimeters. Don't put one in that's 3 millimeters in diameter when you know it should be 6 millimeters in diameter. So essentially, follow the general guidelines and rules of implant placement that you know to be true. What I alluded to in that last slide, the minimum thickness for a hybrid abutment for the Emax is a half a millimeter. So be careful to never make that Emax piece um, thinner than a half a millimeter. It's weak. We, it's time tested at a half a millimeter. Anything less than that, that's when things are going to cause trouble for yourself. There's a minimum thickness of the hybrid abutment crown, one and a half millimeters. Same thing. We know that Emacs in general should be about a millimeter and a half um, when you're putting a crown on a, on a normal tooth, so we have to follow the same rules when we're putting one on a titanium fixture. And third one here is the maximum ceramic wall thickness. If you're going to do, um, especially a screw retained implant, is six millimeters from that screw access to the outer limit of the restoration. In other words, you and I can't go hanging seven, eight, nine, ten millimeters of glass off of something and expect it to work. That's just common sense and something that we've been applying in dentistry already. Um, it doesn't make a difference if it's Emacs or Empress or Zirconia or anything else. There has to be uh, a suitable substructure and just hanging glass off of nothing, not a good idea. Just an image of what we were talking about. If you look at the picture on the left-hand side, you want to make sure that you've got at least a half a millimeter of Emacs from that titanium piece to the external surface. That makes it strong. And if you look at the image on the right, you don't ever want to hang more than six millimeters of Emax off that titanium fixture. It's just unsupported. A couple other rules of the game that we know to be true for implants in general. We want to be careful with patients who have parafunctional habits like bruxism. 
Um, we all know that from an occlusal load standpoint, our patients should be in light centric occlusion. Um, they shouldn't have excursive moments, movements on these restorations, unless of course you're talking a cuspid or an anterior tooth, in which case we have to have them. But we wanna limit the exposure to an implant just based on implant dentistry itself. Um, specific rule to these Emax abutment solutions, Multilink is the only option that Ivoclar and Serona and Patterson are going to stand by. So if you're choosing to make an Emax hybrid abutment or an Emax hybrid abutment crown, when you take that Emax piece and you loot it to the tie base from Serona, you're going to use a very specific multi-link. It's made just for this purpose. That's all you're going to use. And then we're going to be using some fairly caustic materials, so you're going to want to make sure that this is outside your patient's mouth. And we'll go through that process. Pretty straightforward, just new to us and information we need to know. Lastly, you're not going to want to temporarily cement the crown onto the hybrid abutment. The strength of these restorations the strength of this process relies on us definitively looting Emax to tie base, and then if you're going to do a cement retained restoration, the Emax crown to the Emax hybrid abutment. So we've got some block selections. These are new to us, and like I said, they're new to Patterson um, and hot off the presses from Ivoclar, just released uh, at the Yankee Dental Congress here in 2014, which is really, really cool. So if you look at that top, <clears throat> top line horizontally, we've got an Ebrax hybrid abutment. If you look at it, it's got an MO on it. That stands for medium opacity. You're going to use this block when you use the two-piece system. And this block is used for the hybrid abutment portion of it. The reason we use it is that medium opacity blocks out titanium. That's the sole function of it. This particular block was designed to aesthetically overcome the titanium so then when we put an Emax crown on top, everything looks beautiful. Uh, second one down, Emax CAD crown. You're going to put um, either a low translucent block most of the time or high translucent block on top of that hybrid abutment some of the time. Um, recommend low trans more than high trans based on thickness. The thicker your Emax crown that's going to be looted on top, um, the more you have to concern yourself with gray show through. The thinner it is, so the more you've got uh, an abutment that supports it, and the more anterior we are, the more able you are to use either the low trans or the high trans to make the actual crown. Last but not least, the bottom of the screen, the Emax hybrid abutment crown. So that's when we're making one piece. The abutment and the crown are as one unit. So that's a screw retained unit. Um, those blocks are all made out of low translucent because remember, we've got to block out the tie base. Um, and since we're making the abutment and crown as one piece, the thickness of the low trans buys us enough opacity to make that happen but you wouldn't want to use a high trans block. <clears throat> it would show too much gray through, and you don't want to use the MO block because it would be real flat looking in appearance. Okay, shade selection. Ivoclar has gone through some trouble to make our life really, really easy. So on here you see a picture of chocolate cake, and the point of this story, I'll make it very, very fast, is you go out to a restaurant, you have a great chocolate cake for dessert. And maybe you get lucky enough to figure out all the ingredients. The chef comes over and he or she lets you know we've used X amount of milk and so many eggs and this much sugar, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how we bake this cake. What you don't want to do is go home and decide to bake the cake on your own and switch the ingredients up. If they used real sugar, we need to use real sugar. If they used four eggs, don't choose to use three can't use skim milk instead of using whole milk because all of a sudden at the end of the day that delicious chocolate cake you had at the restaurant is very different than the one you've baked at home. Now Ivoclar has done all the work for us. As we are trying to get to a final shade which is that top horizontal <clears throat> column, 
All we need to do is follow the recipe. So if, for example, um, all the way to the left, if you're trying to get to a final shade of BL1, drop down, it's going to tell you what abutment to use. You're going to use the medium opacity zero. You're going to select an Emax block for the surface layer of that crown, a low trans. You're going to use the BL1. If you want to do the BL2, the BLT, three or four, you're going to use that same M0 block and use the corresponding Emax crown. So if you work your way from left to right, what you're going to notice is final shade, second horizontal comment, column, you're going to notice which abutment block to choose. Last column, you're going to notice which Emax block to choose. So when you add up the abutment column with the crown column, you're going to get to the appropriate final shade and it's going to look great every time. If you're going to make life even easier and you're going to go with the screw retained model, if you're going to go with the hybrid abutment crown as one unit, the game gets even simpler. You're simply going to go with your desired shade and choose the appropriate low translucent block that corresponds with that desired shade and you will get exactly what you expect every time. We're going to skip by this and go right into scan posts and tie bases and what's the difference because again this is new to us. Left hand side of the screen what you're looking at are scan posts on that top left. On the lower left you're looking at the scan posts and on top is the scan body. So that gray piece that is sitting on top is simply what makes our life easier when we image it. That's all the scan body is is a reference material that shows us the exact same height. You'll notice there's a, a pyramidal peak that's going to help us later on in the software just to identify where the, the center of that implant is, where the peak of that implant is. On the right hand side of the screen is the tie base. Now ultimately at the end of the day, once we've made our Emacs piece, our Emacs is going to get looted to what you see on the right hand side on that top right. The whole reason Serona came up with the scan post, which is what we see on the left, is real easy to see. It's taller than the tie base. So before you and I had the ability to take this process from start to finish all on our own, our labs would use what you see on the right. They would take a tie base, they would take the white scan body, and they would image on a model. But as you can see, you can hardly see all of that, um, in fact you can't see all of that scan body, it's buried below the tissue. So what Serona came up with is the scan post with the corresponding scan body, which is the left hand side, and that simply makes our life easier because it's tall. No, no matter where that implant is placed gingerly, we've got a lot of real estate to work with. Now, some of you might be asking the question, so how am I going to get a buckle bite when that stands above the actual uh, height of the occlusal table? But stop and think what you do right now. When you're using a physical impression post, most of the time those impression posts are also taller than the occlusal table. And it's for the exact same reason that the scan posts are. It's so we've got a lot of stuff to grab onto so we can get an accurate impression. So all you're going to do when we get to that part for scanning is imagine that you screw this in. So look at the left hand side of the screen. We screw in the scan posts, which are the titanium piece. We put the gray scan body on top. And we're going to image this arch. That's our working arch. We're going to image the opposing. And then when we want to take a buckle bite, all we have to do is simply remove the scan posts and the scan bodies, have our patient bite together, and take a buckle bite. You guys know, we've been all doing CEREC for a long time, that we've got plenty of data when we scan in that cast gold crown, the bicuspid and the cuspid ahead of it, yet alone that lateral. That's plenty of data to take the buckle bite and link it with our working and non-working models. Just a little explanation of scan post versus the tie base. Important point to note, 
This is a highly accurate system to transfer information from our patient's mouth to the CEREC software. But we've got to make sure everything lines up. So if you're looking at that image on the left, what you'll notice is there's a green check mark next to the first image. Why? Vertically, there's notching on that scan post and there's notching on the scan body. When the scan body, which is the cap, is put perfectly in place, it's going to seat all the way. So now we know that there's an intimate fit and our scan will be accurate. If you line them up like the second or the middle image, but it's not seated all the way and you have a gap, that's going to throw us off. If you get it seated all the way, which is hard to do and not have those guys lined up, that's also going to mess things up for us. So just pay attention and again, the function of the height of the scan post and scan body assembly is so that it's all very super gingival and we can look right at it. And these guys snap into place, so it's not going to be uh, a big challenge to do. It's just, again, something for you and I to pay attention to. So what images are we going to need? And this works just like we image everything else with CEREC. So this isn't going to be new to us. It's simply making sure we have the appropriate information. We're going to image the working arch with the scan post and scan body in place. So unscrew a healing cap, screw the scan post and scan body in, take your images. We're going to image the opposing arch. We're going to image a buckle bite, which like I said, what I would highly recommend is do that last, unscrew the scan post and scan body, have your patient close together, piece of cake. We're also going to image the gingival mask. So think about what you do now in a physical impressioning system. When that case comes back from your lab, it typically has a soft tissue model. Why do they do that? So you and I know how much pressure our abutment and or our abutment crown are going to put on the tissue, right? It's an approximation so we're not in there adjusting for 15 minutes because it's putting too much pressure and it won't seat or it's blanching the tissue or that we screw it into place and all of a sudden we've got um, too much of a gap between our restoration and the tissue. Both of those scenarios would be bad. So in CEREC lingo, we're going to image to create the gingival mask. There's two ways to do it. The first way is what we've already talked about, and that's just take working arch images with scan post and body in place, non-working buckle bite, and then just like you and I use the cut tool to eliminate things um, in the software that we don't want to see, or we use the cut tool if we're going to uh, have an assistant maybe image the arch that we're preparing a crown on, and then we're going to cut that tooth that we're working on out and just re-image our prep and superimpose it. Same exact principle. So you can image with the scan post and scan body in the patient's mouth. You can copy that image, leaving one copy in the working arch and the other copy into the gingival mask bucket and then cut out where the scan post and scan body are so you're simply looking at the tissue. That's an easy, easy way to do it. If, however, you prefer to actually take a scan of that, the first set of images that you'll make when you remove the healing cap is the working arch just of the tissue as it is. Now, there's a couple places when we don't want to use the gingival mask, and this is kind of a software, um, ease of software use, as well as when we just don't need it. If you can imagine that a patient comes back to you from your surgeon, and the entire implant fixture is supra-gingival, then the tissue doesn't come into play, right? The, the whole implant restoration from top to bottom is above the tissue, then it really doesn't make much of a difference where that tissue is because unfortunately we're above it. So we don't want to image the gingival mask if that's the case, if the fixture comes back and the entire assembly is supra gingival. The second place where it makes our life a little more difficult and we don't want a gingival mask is when we're looking at that patient in mesial distally there's a big gap between our implant and, say, um, the mesial surface of the posterior tooth and the distal surface of an anterior tooth. 
So imagine for a second we're placing an implant on tooth number 30. But for whatever reason, the surgeon couldn't get a wide diameter implant in there. Maybe the patient didn't want grafting and we didn't have enough bone to do it. So there's a smaller diameter implant. So what are you left with? You're left with a large gap between the implant fixture and the mesial of tooth number 31 and the distal of tooth number 29. There's no reason to capture the gingival mask in that instance because we're going to want to build our restoration out further mesial distally because there won't be any tissue to push out there because the diameter of the implant itself is smaller. So we're going to need to artificially make our restoration bigger mesial distally than we would if that implant um, really approximated the diameter of the root of the natural tooth that was there. So two times when you don't need the gingival mask. One, a big mesial distal dimension where we're going to need to stretch that porcelain out. And two, when that implant comes back to us and for whatever reason is supra gingival and the tissue is out of the way already. Funny image there, that's uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Some of you know Dr. Ray Miller if you're an upstate New Yorker. He decided to take his poor daughter's boyfriend and uh, make him pose along with Bruce Willis there. Do a little play-by-play, -play, but uh, entertaining day. All right, let's talk about where we've been so far. So we've talked about owners and you guys being here and learning some new things. That's great. We've talked about how Ivoclar, Patterson, and Serona come together for this process and who does what. Ivoclar is responsible for making the Emax product. They're also responsible for Multilink, um, the looting agent that's going to bring our Emax abutment or abutment crown to the tie base, as well as the Multilink product that we're already used to when we're cementing Emax crowns. Patterson's going to be the delivery mecha mechanism for both Ivoclar's products and Serona's products. And Serona's bringing to us not only the CEREC and the software, but the tie base. Um, the scan post and the scan body. Um, we've talked about implant companies that we get to work with and we talked a little bit about um, the process and what we're going to need to scan in order to get all that information into CEREC. So let's talk a little bit about some things that are different um, than what we're used to. Finishing this Emacs, our ability to try it in, try it on the tie base as well as try it in the patient's mouth. Um, what we need to concern ourselves with as far as staining, glazing, um, polishing, the final restoration, how do we take this Emax piece and loot it to the tie base, and then uh, how do we insert it into our patient's mouth. So let's talk about the things that we do want to do and the things we don't want to do when we're finishing um, these Emax abutments. So as you guys know, if you have used Emax in the past, um, you want to make your adjustments in the pre-crystallized state. The reason we can use Emacs for a custom abutment solution is it's crazy strong once it's centered. So let's get everything we need to do done when it's in the blue phase. If you're going to separate it from the block, you're going to de-sprue it essentially. Um, a diamond disc works really, really well. That's what we're showing over here on the right. If you look at the top image on the left-hand side of it, we're notching it on the incisal aspect and then we're going to flip that block over and we're actually going to separate it from the base. It's kind of common sense but I bring it up only so you don't accidentally harm your abutment but the diameter of that disc, the hub, the shank of that burr is going to run into that incisal edge. It's either going to score it, it's going to introduce some heat or it's going to introduce micro fractures. So you're going to want to notch it from the incisal and then separate it from the base. Once you've done that and you've gotten everything out of the way, you'll take the actual tie base and try it in. And you can see from both of those images that the fit is pristine. That's what we want to see. If it's hanging up somewhere, something went wrong in this process, you can relieve the Emacs if you need to. But just like most things with CEREC, um, if we do our homework and we go through the process appropriately, these literally drop in and fit like a glove. Once we've de-sprued it, you can polish that sprue up. 
Um, a fine diamond, keep it moist, you know, keep it cool. You don't want to overheat it. And as you think about uh, finishing off where that sprue was, bear in mind that this is going to be sprued somewhere where the emergence profile of your restoration is going to be. So if you look at those bottom images, they kind of show you the location of a typical sprue. You and I need to be careful as we polish that back to make sure that we either don't overdo it or underdo it because then you know we'll be milling out another one. Important thing to note and again common sense we're going to want to adjust this gingival to where our crown is going to fit. If this is a hybrid abutment and we're going to be fabricating an Emax crown then we know that Emax is going to fit perfectly on this hybrid abutment unless you and I decide we're going to be polishing um, where those two pieces come together. So think of it as polishing the cuff of this restoration, where this restoration is going to sit against the tissue, but not at the interface, not the finish line or anything incisal to any part of the prep, essentially. Uh, once you've adjusted it, throw it in an ultrasonic, clean it off. If you happen to have a steam cleaner, that works great as well. But one thing to remember is you absolutely don't want to micro-braid Emacs. Now that holds true for any Emacs restoration. It doesn't matter if it's a hybrid abutment, a hybrid abutment crown, a crown itself, an inlay onlay, whether we've milled it or somebody has pressed it in a lab, uh, microabrasion is bad for Emacs and introduces microfracture. Same process holds true for the hybrid abutment crown, um, separating with the disc, using your polishers, the only difference is, you know, the second guy down here is to make sure that we're running a fine diamond over the occlusal table just to kind of clean it up. It gets it ready for us to, um, to either um, crystallize it or if we're going to be doing staining and glazing. But um, the process is, is the same. A little picture here. This is a kit of the Multilink Hybrid Abutment Cement. So this kit is designed specifically for looting Emacs to Serona's tie base. Um, what you'll notice in here is not only the multi-link in the kit, um, but you're going to notice that there is a, a cartridge of virtual extra light body in there. And that's going to help us try these components on with one another as well as try this in a patient's mouth. Now we all know that in the beginning we're going to feel most comfortable trying things in and once we've done a few hundred of these we're going to start feeling pretty comfortable that they're going to drop into place just like our Sarah crowns and our inlays and onlays do. So it's nice though. I have a class really thought of everything and put uh, the virtual extra light body in here. We're going to go through how to use that. So here's the deal if you have a hybrid abutment. So again, this is the two-piece system. We've milled out a custom abutment. We've milled out a separate Emacs crown. But let's take a look. Um, image on the top hand right shows us trying in that hybrid abutment on the tie base. Now what you'll notice on there is we've taken a water soluble marker and, and we've marked um, how these line up. So I don't know if you recall but there was an image earlier on where we showed that the inside of the Emacs had the female notch and the tie base had the male notch. All this marker does for us is help us to recognize how things are lined up. So when we're in the heat of the moment, we don't have to think how these two pieces come together. So we take this comes right off, so no worries, but we're going to take a water-soluble marker. We're going to mark that negative notch on the Emacs. We're going to mark where the positive notch and the tie base are so we can slide this hybrid abutment on and off really easily and know exactly where we need to be. Once we've done that and we know everything fits perfectly, um, you can take a cotton pellet, you could take a foam pellet, and basically you're going to block the screw access hole of that tie base. So nothing um, that we're going to use is going to get inside that screw chamber. Once you've done that, we're going to take the virtual extra light body and we're going to coat the outside of the tie base and the inside of the Emacs hybrid abutment. And because we've got these nice markings to know where we're going to go, we're going to seat that on the Emax onto the tie base. We're going to let it set, and then you can take a scalpel blade. It's 
if you guys have ever used virtual, you know the fast set is setting in you know a couple minutes is really efficient. And you're going to trim off all the extra light body. Then you can pull any of the light body that expressed into the screw axis out. And what will come with it is the cotton pellet or the foam pellet. So now you know you've got a clean system. You, on a temporary basis, you've got a very, very thin film of virtual extra light body that's holding together your tie base with your Emacs hybrid abutment or hybrid abutment crown. The process is the same. So then if you look to the bottom of the screen, what can we do? We can take that hybrid abutment, we can try it in the patient's mouth, we can screw it in, make sure everything seats predictably, make sure the finish line is where you'd like it to be, make sure everything looks great. Then we can put another foam pellet inside or a cotton pellet. We can coat the inside of uh, the Emacs crown. A little glycerin gel just keeps all the stuff out of there. Take a little bit of the virtual extra light body, put it inside the crown, seat that right on top, wait for the extra light body to set, clean it up, and what do you have? You've got a perfect try-in without any true looting agents. You can check the occlusion, the contours, everything that you probably check right now when you're just fabricating an Emacs crown on a natural tooth. We want to go through all that process right now in our patient's mouth before we actually center anything in case we need to make any changes. Beautiful part about using the virtual is as you can see in the lower left-hand portion, it literally peels right off. So it'll peel off where we took the crown and looted it to the hybrid abutment. It will also peel right off the inside of that hybrid abutment where we looted it to the tie base. We unscrew everything and we're ready to roll. Like I mentioned, process is exactly the same if we use this for the hybrid abutment or the hybrid abutment crown as far as how we use virtual. At this point, the only difference is instead of two pieces, we have one piece so we can screw this into our patient's mouth and do the same thing. Check our proximal contacts, check our contours, check our occlusion and make sure everything makes perfect sense. Just a little sorbet for you. Not a big fan of Dr. Oz. He hasn't really helped us much out in dentistry, so break it up a little bit. So once we've tried everything in and we know this is exactly how we'd like it to be in our patient's mouth, um, we have an opportunity to get this prepared for uh, both sintering or staining, staining and glazing, um, whatever it is we're going to do. Now, FYI, you can stain and glaze this gingival portion of a hybrid abutment as well as the gingival portion, the underside of a hybrid abutment crown, if you're doing it as one piece. However, if aesthetically we don't need to do that, because this is going to be either at the tissue or below the tissue, it is highly recommended that we polish the surface as opposed to staining and glazing the surface. Like I said, you can do this if this portion of this custom abutment is going to be super gingival for some reason, then it can be stained and glazed, but we don't need to, number one, and there are advantages to not doing it, number two, because it decreases the likelihood of you and I getting any glaze paste on the underside of this and therefore stopping that perfect fit of the tie base to the abutment or the abutment crown. As well as there's a lot of research to show that a polished Emacs surface here that's going to be underneath the tissue or touching the tissue is actually the most kind surface to the tissue. So uh, long and the short of it is when you can, polish. Remember, don't polish anything that's going to be a part of the actual abutment where the crown's going to fit. That will affect how the crown fits. But once you've gone through the system of rubber polishers, you guys know Ivoclar makes great products in Astropol that are specifically designed for Emacs. Go through that process. Again, you can steam clean or you can throw it in a water bath. This is the key part right here. This is different and this is an area where if you're anything like me, um, you might need this pointed out for you because my common sense told me to do something that um, shouldn't be done. So special tray, you guys probably all have it already, and pin system when we go to fire this Emacs. 
But what you're going to notice if you're going to use the firing pin, if you look at the bottom, um, you're going to take object fix like you've done in the past. Um, the putty or the fix are both fine to use, whichever you prefer. And you're going to seat your restoration on the pin. Now if you look at the bottom left hand side, that's what it should look like. You shouldn't see any of that pin poking through the screw retained channel. You should simply be supporting the restoration, whether it's the hybrid abutment crown, which you see on the left side, or the hybrid abutment itself, which is to the right in that first image on the left. On the right, bottom right hand side, you see what not to do, and that is taking the object fix, placing it in the hybrid abutment or hybrid abutment crown, and then kind of forcing that pin into that screw chamber. The reason you don't want to do that is that can put pressure on the inside of your Emacs restoration, which in turn, as this fires and heats and cools, can introduce cracks inside the Emacs. So support the restoration like you see on the bottom left hand side. Don't push through so the pin shows like you see on the bottom right. That's a no-no. Other option, you are open to taking that same object fix creating a nice little uh, snow cone and seating it right on the tray, which you can see you don't want the Emacs touching the tray. There's a good two millimeters of object fix there, but you can go right to the tray and do that as well. And then just like in the previous slide, we just need to clean the object fix out of there once it's sintered. Uh, throwing in a water bath is great. Steam cleaning is great. We just want to make sure we get all that object fix or object putty out from the inside so we're able to use multi-link and get a really nice bond between this Emacs and that tie base. Just a little image here as a reminder that when you seat it on that pin, if the object putty or the object fix starts creeping up the surface of the Emacs on the external surface, you want to support the restoration, but you don't want to block your ability to get glaze on there if we're going to be glazing down there. So just clean it off, take a little water with a brush. You can take a little plastic instrument and kind of support it, but push it away from the Emacs. Um, but common sense stuff, just a reminder. All right, staining and glazing. Just like we do with other Emacs restorations, we can either do this pre-crystallization or post-crystallization. So if you're comfortable right now staining and glazing in one step on the blue block, go for it. This process works exactly the same. If you're not comfortable with that, and you'd like to center the restoration so you convert it, and then you want to stain it and glaze it, go for it. You can use uh, either system, whatever is working right in your hands right now. Uh, feel free to continue what you're using. If you're not comfortable with this process, and you're close at all to Ivaclar, I can tell you this, they do a masterful job of inviting us in and having their ceramists teach uh, both us as dentists and our team members, how to stain and glaze. We brought our team there about nine years ago, spent a morning, and, and I'm here to tell you that uh, Christy and Stephanie in my office, um, they stain and glaze about 90% of the restorations that we do, and um, they're excellent at it. They really, truly are. So take advantage of what Iva Clar is uh, offering us as far as help goes. It's a wonderful alternative. And if you're far away from Ivaclar and you're watching this, sit down with uh, whatever lab that you do business with. I'm quite sure that they'll be happy to show you how to stain and glaze and well. It's not hard if you're not doing it now. It's just a new process. Um, but the paste systems are simple to do, simple to use. Um, it's just a matter of doing a process that you may or may not be accustomed to having incorporated into your practice right now. So one thing to remember um, MO blocks and the LT blocks, which we're going to use both of if we're using a hybrid abutment and a separate crown. We'll use both the MO block and the LT block. Um, or one of, if you're doing the hybrid abutment crown as one piece, you'll use the LT block. They fire at different times. Now, if you're using Ivaclar's program at oven, piece of cake. The MO blocks are on program number seven. It comes to you locked and loaded and ready to roll. And the LT blocks, just like the HT blocks and the multi block, um, fire at specific times that are all preloaded into that oven. So just be aware of the different firing times. Now, some of you who may want to fire both 
the MO block and the LT block at the same time, that is A-OK -okay to do. So when would you do that? If you're using the two-piece system and you're making a hybrid abutment out of the MO block and you're making the final restoration, the crown that goes on top, out of the LT block, you may decide to put those in the oven at the same time. Perfectly fine. You just want to fire at the MO block or the number 7 on the program at oven. It's a little bit longer of a cycle. It's not going to hurt the LT block, but the MO block needs that extra time. So it's okay to put them both in at the same time. Just be sure to use the MO block time when you do that. All right, so we talked a little bit about uh, the third one here. <clears throat> Even if you are going to stain and glaze the uh, hybrid abutment on that base or the hybrid abutment crown on the tissue side, you want to be real careful and keep the glaze paste away from the screw channel. If any of that, even the smallest amount, gets inside, you're not going to be able to seat this block on the tie base, and that intimate fit is what this is all about. So be careful. Like I said, if aesthetics allow, polish it. Um, then you can stay away with the glaze paste and also you're going to have a really nice tissue interface. Okay, one semi-technical slide here and I put this on because it's so, so important. Some of you have been to courses in the past. Some of you, I promise, will go to courses in the future. There are Ivoclar approved firing times and then there are some folks out there talking about shortening times um, under those approved times. So there, uh, there's a standard, a traditional firing time that's, you know, call it 24 to 30 minutes, depending on whether it's the LT block or the MO block. There's also a speed glaze that you guys are probably using for Emacs units right now. That's a 15-minute cycle. I caution you with this slide to uh, steer clear of listening to the advice that you can do this in under 15 minutes. And here's why. Image on the left. That's what Emacs looks like when it's in the blue phase. You actually have something called lithium metasilicate at that phase. It's got the strength of an empress crown. It's about 168 megapascals in that blue phase. When we center it for the appropriate amount of time, it goes from lithium metasilicate to lithium disilicate. So all the research, all the strength, all the wonderful accolades that Emacs gets is 100% dependent on us properly taking it from that blue phase to the final phase that you see on the right. And if you looked at that under a microscope, as you can see, it's a very, very different picture. We are actually growing crystals from these tiny metasilicate particles to these giant disilicate particles. And if you shortcut the oven time, you never get to lithium disilicate. The problem is, when you shortcut it and pull it out of the oven, it's going to look like the color you've selected. So if you chose A2, it's going to look like A2. And you and I aren't going to know how much of those crystals converted from metasilicate to disilicate. So please, 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 um, follow the instructions, bake the chocolate cake. All right, <clears throat> let's talk about looting to the tie base. This is, in Ivoclar's estimation, the place where uh, you and I might get a little antsy. We're used to the materials. We're used to imaging. We can follow that and do that very, very well. What we're not used to is being a lab to this regard and taking two dissimilar materials and putting them together. It's not difficult, it's just literally, again, just like choosing shade, just like firing at the appropriate time, it is following that chocolate cake recipe. So, here's some things to know. Microbraiding. You are not going to ever microbraid the Emacs. We talked about that. You are going to microbraid the tie base to get it ready. Etching. We are going to etch the Emacs piece for 20 seconds, not for a minute, not for 45 seconds, for 20 seconds. We're not going to need to etch the tie base. Then what we're going to use is Monobond Plus on everything. 
both the titanium tie base as well as our Emacs piece stays on for one minute. We are going to use Multilink's hybrid abutment cement to bring those two pieces together. And we're going to make sure we do this always outside of our patient's mouth because we don't want to put uh, the hydrofluoric gutch in their mouth and we, we don't want to put this hybrid abutment cement um, in their mouth while it's setting. It's just it's caustic stuff. Um, once we've got that in place, we're going to cover that joint with glycerin gel. Liquid strip is one of many examples out there. That's just to uh, take care of that oxygen inhibited layer that we've known about for years and years with uh, composites. It's going to cure for seven minutes on its own. Um, once it's cured, we can polish it just like we polish other, other uh, areas in dentistry and we'll show you how to do all that. But this is a really, really important slide to remember. Again, that's the kit. Those are the two components I just wanted to remind you of. We've got that positive on the Serona tie base. We've got the negative notching on the Emax portion. Those are going to get lined up together just like we did when we tried it in. We're going to use a, a little waterproof marker here. We're going to seat them on and make sure things are lined up first. Once we know they're lined up, we're going to do just what we did before. We're going to take a little foam pellet block that access hole. We're going to take some virtual extra light body and now we're just going to block things out because we only want to get the multi-link where we want the multi-link to go. So we're going to block out gingival to where we're working. You can see that on that top right portion. That's going to make sure that no multi-link sneaks in between there. We're also going to take a little bit of virtual and just seal off that tie base on top to make sure no multi-link sneaks in there. So our screw channel is protected and gingival to our tie base is also protected. And then we're going to do exactly what that previous slide said. We're going to micro abrade the tie base. We can rinse that off. Steam cleaning is real nice to do, but rinse it off with um, a water bath if you don't have that. Ultrasonic it essentially. We're going to monobond the tie base. We're not going to microbade the Emax. Instead, we're going to etch it for 20 seconds with the same you know, hydrofluoric etching that we've used on Emax in the past. Once we've rinsed and, and dried that off, we're going to use the same monobond on the Emax portion of it. Then we're going to use the multi-link hybrid abutment cement. We're going to apply that both to the tie base that you see on the top left. As you can see, we've got that screw chamber blocked out. And we're going to apply to the inside of the Emax hybrid abutment or hybrid abutment crown, depending on if we made this as a one piece or a two piece. We're going to seat it. We've got our nice magic marker lined up so we know we're in the right spot. And this is key. We're going to hold it in place for about five seconds. Five seconds gets us to an initial set which means now our job is to make sure that if we've got any of this hybrid abutment cement inside the screw chamber where the Emax is, we can take a little micro brush and we can clean it out. And if you just kind of go with a little twirling motion, you'll pull it all out of there. Spend a, you know, spend a couple seconds to make sure that's all out. Now, once it's got an initial set, which is really important, so two to three minutes initial set, now you can start taking a scalpel blade and you can start cleaning off the exterior surface of where that multi-link is. We can't afford to wait for it inside where the screw chamber is, so we do that right away with the micro brush. But we wait two to three minutes to clean it off the exterior surface. And then we can use a blade, clean most of that off, take a little bit of the glycerin gel, um, which you see on the lower left, seal it up. Hold those two pieces together for the full seven minute cure. You can use calipers like you see. You can hold it with your hands um, up to you. But the key is just to hold those two pieces in place. Get that full seven minute cure. Steam clean it off. Polish it up with the same polishers that you use to polish Emacs um, right now for your crown and bridge. Make sure if there is any residual uh, multi-link inside that Emax portion that you've cleaned it out, you can use a fine diamond with a high speed. Make sure you're not overheating the Emax when you do that. Hopefully you got most of it out with the micro brush, but if you didn't, you'll see it. 
You probably remember the slide. It was pretty opacious, so it's going to be pretty obvious for you and I to see. And then at the end of the process, you're going to have either the hybrid abutment looted in place or the hybrid abutment crown looted in place. Not so bad, just new. Same thing goes if you're doing the hybrid abutment crown um, as that other process. So what do we have now? If you're doing this in two stages and we're going to be looting an Emacs crown to our abutment, we've got to treat the external surface of the hybrid abutment as well as the internal surface of our Emacs crown just like we would if it was a natural tooth. So same process as far as getting the Emacs ready. We need to hydrofluoric etch we need to monobond both of those surfaces, and then we're ready to roll. And the only difference, if we're going to use this process of a hybrid abutment two-piece with a separate crown, or a hybrid abutment crown as one piece, uh, if we screw retain and do the one piece, we're going to have to come back, and we're going to have to, again, block out once the screw is tightened down, take a foam pellet, take a cotton pellet, put it in place, Take some Evo Ceram, um, place it in the actual access chamber, cure it, polish it, just like you're doing right now, and we're in business. And last but not least, the Hail Mary play, which I mentioned before. So some of you guys are going to be real comfortable with sprinting right out of the gate. We're going to take this process, we're going to mill this piece, we're going to loot it together, we're going to bond in our patient's mouth, everything is going to go really, really smoothly. Some of you are going to feel like this is an awful lot of information and this is a lot to carry on my shoulders. So as you start to learn, what I would encourage you to do is don't say this isn't for you necessarily. Maybe just delegate some of those pieces of this puzzle which seem a little daunting. We all know because we've been milling out crowns and inlays and onlays that we're capable of imaging. We know we're capable of milling and we know we're capable of inserting. Um, we've been doing that forever in dentistry. So what's the one piece that's really, really different? It's taking the Emacs and looting it to the tie base. If you feel like this process is a little intimidating for you, sit down and talk to your lab. I'm quite sure that they'll take the time to work with you and either walk you through the process and show you or if you really want them to handle that process, I would imagine they'd be happy to create a program where you milled the pieces out, delivered it to the lab, they looted them together, returned them to you, and you went about finishing this process. If, however, your lab doesn't want to do that, I'll give you the name of a lab that we use an awful lot in our office called Grazer's Dental Ceramics. They're based out of East Amherst, New York. You can look them up. Um, you can Google them. Tom and his team are excellent, and they are building a very minor fee. So you and I have the ability, if we so choose, to mill out the hybrid abutment or the hybrid abutment crown on our own. Tom's team's willing to loot these pieces together and return it to us. Now it adds an extra step, and it adds some time. So I don't recommend this as your permanent solution. I do recommend it if you're hesitant to get the ball rolling. So if you're not 100% comfortable, but you want to get in the game, go ahead and do what you do best and ask for help. And help is there. So I hope we didn't take too long to do that. If you have questions or concerns, like I said, please feel free to go to the forum section and either start a new forum post if you want to post pictures of where you're having trouble, please feel free to do that. And if you see a form on there that's already addressing some of your needs and you just want to add to it, um, that's in our forum section at IgniteDDS.com, which you are here watching this video under. Thanks for your time. Have a great day.